Eyewitness News presents Newsmakers, winner of the Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasting Award for Excellence in Public Affairs Programming, with your hosts, Jane Ann Bugda and Andy Mahalshik. Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugda along with Andy Mahalshik. The Institute for Public Policy and Economic Development at Wilkes University has a long history in our area. The Institute's research has been the driving force behind a lot of projects and programs across our region. And today we are taking a closer look at their work. When we come back, I'll introduce you to our guests and our discussion will begin when this edition of Newsmakers returns right after this. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Jane Ann Bugged along with Andy Mahalshik. The Institute for Public Policy and Economic Development at Wilkes University is our topic of conversation today. Uh, we are joined by Terry Holmes, who's the Executive Director, and Susan Magnata, who is the Director of Community Outreach. And you may have heard of the Institute, and, um, but you may not be aware of the impact that their research has on our region and and our everyday life. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, you've been involved in a lot of research over the years and we want to start by um, talking a little bit about the history. And we're going to call it the Institute because we're not going to go through the whole name. But for the, uh, So tell us a little bit of the history of the Institute and a little bit about what you do. The Institute was formed uh, in 2004 as a result of a challenge grant from a Wilkes alum who came back to visit family uh, and was very distraught at what was happening in the community. He saw a community that was downsizing, that uh, had increasing blight, uh, lost jobs, and offered a challenge grant to Wilkes University to identify a strategy to try and help rebuild the community. So at the time, Wilkes joined with significant members of the business community as well as the other colleges and universities in Luzerne County to talk about how something like that could be done. And they came to the realization that one of the best things that the university could do would be to provide information and data to inform decision making. Because so often communities, nonprofits, and even businesses tend to make decisions by fire. Um, and without a lot of emphasis and understanding of history and trends and data and the relationship between those things. So uh, with that, the Institute was born. And as you mentioned, um, it's based at Wilkes University, mm -hmm. but it's not only Wilkes. Who else, what other universities are involved? Well, in the initial planning stages, Wilkes engaged uh, the other higher education institutions in Luzerne County, uh, King's College, Misericordia University, Penn State Wilkesbury, uh, and Luzerne County Community College. Uh, once we actually started work and started looking into the data in the region, we, we came to realize that Wilkesbury and Luzerne County are part of a broader economic region, which includes Lackawanna County mostly dir directly, as well as some of the other counties, but really Lackawanna Wanna County. And with that realization was the recognition that if one county or one community were to succeed, revitalize and sustain, it wouldn't sustain it for long if the other communities weren't following suit. So a regional approach to enhance, enhancing assets, mitigating challenges, uh, and working together would likely be the most successful opportunity uh, that would be lasting and the most impactful. So at that juncture, we started with the higher education uh, institutions in Lackawanna County, and uh, we now have folks like the University of Scranton and Marywood and Johnson College and Keystone College, the medical school, and even the Wright Center for Graduate Medical Education. Um, that are at the table, again, along with the business community. And is it, is it safe to say, Susan or Terry, that really data helps connect the dots between all those organizations, nonprofits, educational, economic, business, because you were saying before, Terry, you know, you can't wing it. You know, you make decisions under fire. You think you know something's happening. Oh, I'm pretty sure it's happening. But now, today, we hear a lot about analytics, and data is the key to really connecting everyone together and, and you're finding out where the puzzle fits together. Mm -hmm. um, one of our board members put it 
really um, succinctly when he said, "It's you don't want to be flying a plane in the dark when you're trying to make important decisions that affect the health of our communities and the um, our economy." So, um, you know, what Terry and her team of researchers do at the institute is provide the region with the data, the research, the um, troubleshooting, and <coughs> recommendations so that we can have a very strong um, healthy um, communities and that will hopefully you know entice businesses to come here and workers to come here to and that in turn gives us a healthy economy. You have a pretty impressive client list and not only are they communities and um, from around the area but tell us a little bit about some of the people that you work with. Oh. We have a number of clients uh, from around the region, uh, local governments. That we've done work for the state government, the federal government, uh, several local nonprofits, regional nonprofits, as well as a number of private business and industry. Um, we also have a track of community-based research, which is research that we just complete for public consumption uh, in hopes that uh, both policymakers and um, organizations will look at the research and recognize that they're in a position to take that data, to take those recommendations and implement programs or initiatives or even policy and regulation that promote positive change. Well, it's really fascinating if I can grab the brochure, the uh, magazine, you know, I call it a magazine because it, it really, really blew me away several years ago when we started covering and reporting on, you do an annual report, whatever the year is, indicators report, and you really analyze what's happening in northeastern Pennsylvania. And this data, I thought to myself as a reporter, as a journalist, you know, to research this data on our own would take days, if not weeks, to get it all organized. And there you are presenting it on a silver platter <laughs> to organizations, and not, I'm not making light of it, but or, or being flippant with it, but information that really, I'm sure, when I read this report every year and see your, your report uh, in person, you're like, I did not know that. And I've been around, it's my hometown, but the information in here can really be utilized by a business or nonprofit and say, you know, I did not know that. And it makes a big difference in where they're moving forward. Let's talk a little bit about what you found this year in, in the indicator. What was the top finding? Um, I think one of the, the, the top findings is people uh, always believe that GE were, were not an economically viable region, that there's too many challenges here, too many things that are going wrong. Um, and what we're finding out is that we're a very competitive economic region. Uh, we have job growth now. We have business growth. Um, we're, we're a global player. We have a significant export market. Uh, the gross regional product of the area has been increasing rapidly. Um, so economically, the region is doing well quality of life, standard of living is improving. It's not improving for everybody, but it is improving. So we're on the right track. Um, we didn't get all of our issues in overnight or in one or two years, so it takes a little longer to correct them, especially when there are so many other external and internal forces at play. Um, going to the point, again, that our, our region or any one community in the region isn't an island, but it is part of a bigger pie. Is it, and, and Susan and I, we were talking before we hit air today that sometimes, and I'm going to say this anecdotally, I don't have the facts like you guys have, sometimes Northeastern Pennsylvania is its own worst enemy because they make, we hear comments being made or analysis being done without the facts, which you provide, and sometimes those, those assumptions are just not true. I mean, how, how often do you find that when you go into the group, if you approach somebody about, you know, maybe supporting the institute, and they say, "Well, I know that's not the case, or this is, you know, it's it's not a good thing," and you show them the facts in the black and white or color, and say, "I respectfully disagree. That's not the case." Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting because when I started this you know, with the institute, and I started going into different businesses and meeting with some of our board members, that's a frustration that's consistent with so many people because we have such a great region, and um, you know what. What I think may have happened is that you know it was a we, we our region did go through some difficult times and so I don't know if that gets passed down from generation to generation a little bit um, but there are a lot of people not just us like working really really hard to um, change that perception and doing great things uh, in the region and it, and it really is moving forward um, so it's exciting to see 
And I know when we were talking about some of the uh, findings of this year's study, public transportation was one of the main um, needs in our area. And why is that? And that's something that is something new for, for our area, that we need more public transportation? Well, we started working with the Scranton Area Foundation, which brought in the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's Community Development Department to look at transportation. And so we were given a great opportunity to provide those two organizations with some research. And what we found out through our research is that transportation, equitable transportation, is an impediment to many things. It's an impediment to jobs. Um, there are people out there willing and able to work but can't adequately get to work. They don't have a vehicle. Um, and and uh, there are people that have moved here from major metropolitan areas just making the general assumption that there was a variety of multimodal transportation options where they came from. It's where they're going to, and then they get here and find out that that's also not the case. Um, and so it impacts health care, uh, people missing appointments because they can't get there, uh, everything from education and shopping to religious activities. So it is an impediment. Um, there's not as many options here. Uh, the system is, is not robust and is constrained by a number of federal and state regulations. Um, and so there is an opportunity to work with the public transit systems and other transit providers to provide more options, make it more accessible, and make it equitable so that people of different income levels can choose to ride it, not just if you have to, but in most other larger metropolitan communities, it's the transportation of choice. And I think a lot of people will be happy to hear that if that there is a need and that there's something co is will be done about it because of this research and and well the, the the existing transportation agencies in the counties are are on board and they they want to be part of the solution um, like I said they operate in a very complex regulatory environment on a both federal and state level um, and uh, so they have to work within those guidelines but then partnering them with other providers privately owned businesses that provide transportation and things like that is a great way to expand the system uh, to make it diversified and to offer options. I know over the years we would interview uh, folks who said, I'd like to work in the Humboldt Industrial Park or Hanover Industrial Park or uh, Center Point in Pittston Township. They could not get there. I know like Colts at LCTA now are making the effort mm -hmm. and they have some programs to get to those places uh, so people can take advantage of these jobs. You know, Chewy.com just moved into Hanover Township, big, big employer. I know they're working with transportation to get people into that into that uh, industrial park. I think what this whole situation brought to light is that transportation is a key element in our region's economic development and quality of life. And so the transportation providers need to be at the table, um, both in land use planning and business development opportunities, and then be part of the solution. And that's something that we never really had to deal with before um, because everybody had their own cars or multiple cars and we were a, a, a independent car community and now times are changing as they are all over the country so it's time to think out of the box and look for innovative solutions unique partnerships and collaborative efforts to resolve some of the challenges if I may very quickly the uh, South Cross Valley Expressway the expansion I know Senator John you did uh, and Eddie Day Pashinsky did a lot of work down there uh, as long with local lawmakers and stakeholders when you see the roundabouts and the, the expansion of that highway down there. And mm -hmm. a lot of folks, quite frankly, have said, why do we need this big infrastructure here? What's down here? Well, you're not going to get the big companies moving in if they can't move logistically, get their product there, mm -hmm. not just employees, but product in and out and their employees. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. That's true, and uh, this region is one of the more attractive regions for those types of companies because we're direct route from the ports. Um, you can get up and down the eastern seaboard pretty much within a day's travel from um, this particular area, even going uh, westward, and you reach about a third of the U.S. population by doing so. So it is a place that businesses want to be because they can get their products to market a large market within a day. And let me just ask quickly, when you're putting together something like that, when someone comes to you and say, I need a research project, and I, how long does it take to do? Is it 
is there a time limit or <laughs> it, to me it would take the forever. Eyes are rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It really depends on the nature of the project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many of the things we do involved securing data like the indicators report and actually because there are over 125 different indicators in that report that's about an eight, eight month project mm -hmm. but a lot of the research that we do especially that's proprietary in nature for different types of organizations involves actually going out into the community and uh, conducting surveys and small focus groups and interviews and things like that take a significant amount of time. So I, I have to say there are projects that we can get done in a month and other projects where it's nearly a year. And one of the unique findings uh, we were talking about um, was about fluoride in water that came about. And I thought this was quite interesting. During your research, you found that there was one community in our area that has fluoride in their water. Tell us about this. Um, we facilitate, uh, convene, and provide research support for seven volunteer task forces. And they're comprised of individuals from all over the two county area representing all different sectors. One on health and health care last year wanted us to research the topic of oral health uh, in part because the t statistics relating to oral health are poor, but also poor oral health causes a significant number of medical issues beyond the mouth. And, and there was the hope that by creating this awareness and educating that perhaps we could help look at solutions that will minimize the problem. Well, through that process, we studied fluoridation and we found out that in the two county region, the only community that has fluoridated water is the city of Hazleton. And so that <laughs> is obviously an issue. So and an impediment. Yeah, yeah, that is very fascinating. And that's our hometown, <laughs> right. quite frankly. So absolutely. Andy and I are going to smile. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it's interesting because you're right, though, and you see a lot more research now about how your dental health is connected to everything, it's especially everything. heart disease mm -hmm. or bacteria. It's not just having a nice smile. It's, it's your mm -hmm. overall health. So we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, with a we're smile. Gonna, uh, with a smile, and we're <laughs> going to talk more about how the Institute is funded and how you can learn more about getting research done for your community organization. You are watching Newsmakers. We are a proud recipient of three Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasting Awards for Excellence in Public Affairs Programming. You can find information on today's show on pahomepage.com. We are under the Newsmakers link, and we'll be right back. And welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Andy Mahalish, along with Jane, Jane Ann Bugda. We are talking with uh, Susan Magnata and Terry Ohms from the, I'm going to get straight here, the Institute for Public Policy and Economic Development at Wilkes University. A lot of words for uh, the bottom line is putting data together, researching that data across northeastern Pennsylvania, and using that data to make our area better. And I'm looking through the 2018 Indicators Report, and we'll show you that a little bit later on, the 2018 Indicators Report, and they talk about everything from health care to transportation to job creation to education. You name it, it's in this report. Honestly, folks, this is a must-read if you care about the area as far as the expansion. Let me ask uh, Susan very quickly, this information, the impact, how would you describe the impact this information can have on our area? What have you seen in, in recent years? Well, it's that book um, that's presented. We have an indicators event every year in May. So we just had um, one on May 10th at Mohegan San Pocado. And it's open to the public, but leaders from the community come and they, this is presented the, the data in the book on the region and then the task force research that we were just discussing on education, um, health care, workforce, transportation, and every year we meet in June and come up with a topic with um, leaders in all those areas and that research is presented at the indicators event. P that research is then, we don't implement, so people in the area that are um, deal with like health care, they take that information and, and the research and help to make the region better. Last year the oral health task force that met with and presented the uh, the research. People took are taking that data now, and their a task force on dental health was created, and um, they're going forward to help the you know on different ways. And you could speak to that a little bit more. Improve the region's dental health. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, and what what other impact 
Go ahead. Well, they're looking at how can we get fluoridated water into the water systems in northeastern Pennsylvania uh, to improve oral health and thereby improve physical health. Um, and uh, the Scranton Area Foundation form, formed a dental uh, health care consortium, and they're helping to fund and operate that. Um, we had the opportunity through one of the ta our public safety task force uh, looking at gang crime uh, that was occurring in the region and uh, had the ability to work with the behavioral analysis unit of the FBI uh, with their gang profiles so that they could tell us what gangs are operating here, how to mitigate gang activity. And uh, one of the things one of the FBI profilers told us is once you have street gangs in your community, you're unlikely to eradicate them entirely, but you can minimize their impact and minimize their impact by focusing on developing children, working with the youth, uh, looking at after school programs and ways to keep them occupied. So we began looking at best practices and after school programs, uh, studied initiatives across the country, and we learned about the SHINE program in Carbon County that was developed by Lehigh Carbon Community College. It had been operating for about a decade by then, so had a decade worth of data demonstrating how it improved academic performance in at-risk children, as well as kept them out of trouble. And uh, we thought since we had some issues on the education side as well, that this would be a win-win for our region. So we wrote a case study. It was adopted by the task force. Um, Congressman Barletta and State Senator John Udichak um, jumped on the information and said we need to see if that pilot program can be replicated here in Luzerne County. And uh, they were very active in raising the funds and helping to establish it. And it's currently operating in Luzerne County in uh, five school districts right now. Uh, and initial data shows that replication of the model has been successful uh, and so we're working through that effort to improve academic outcomes as well as keep children safe and, and shielded from juvenile delinquency. And what's fascinating about that from the political perspective because you know D's and R's have an impact on different fast aspects of our community but you have Republican Barletta, Democrat Udichak, politics wasn't involved in it. No. It was about taking care of street gangs, what, what, what impact they have on that data. And I, I saw that report, it just, uh, it showed when we come together, there is no politics in keeping our kids safe mm -hmm. or keeping these projects that, are, that impact all of us. It's not a Republican or Democratic issue, it's for all of us. So that was a big, I, I thought a big deal that you had two it's huge. different mm -hmm. people, it's, parties. It's huge. And I think that kind of success should demonstrate that if you could form unique collaborations of stakeholders from all of the communities who are willing to forget about geographic and political lines, forget about political parties and say, we've got an issue, we're all dealing with it, let's work together to resolve it, we're going to see more successes and more long-term successes in helping to correct some of the challenges that we face as a region. And it was your research that helped keep prisons open in our region through um, when they were about to close. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, we were asked to complete an economic impact study that would look at the economic impact of the loss of the prison as an employer in the communities in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and as you would expect, something of that magnitude is a multi-million dollar loss on an annual basis. And uh, that information was taken to Harrisburg and was presented to uh, the governor and his team. And as a result of much of that data, um, the prisons remained open. And now there is legislation going through uh, both the state senate and the house to say that community analysis and economic impact ought to be considered as part of the process when looking at closing state facilities and communities. And we covered those hearings in Harrisburg and, and your data really, what we found out covering the, as the story unfolded, was that many citizens did not realize, they say, what impact does retreat have on my life, or Frackville, or Waymart? When they saw the data and it was communicated, not just by eyewitness news, but through the lawmakers, people, I think, got a, 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 a wake-up call said, wow, that's a big deal if that prison closes. We have about two minutes left. I want to ask, uh, how does someone reach out to you if they need a research project? What should they do? 
Um, a call, mm -hmm. I would say, <laughs> or email, um, and you know, Terry can meet with them or over the phone. She's been doing this a long time, so um, and she's uh, good at what she does. And how are you funded? Two different ways. We we have client work. It's 50-50, 50% 50, 50 client work, and then the indicators event, the book that you love. <laughs> <your> I love <laughs> it. I'm uh, taking it home and reading it today. In fact, mm -hmm. again, <laughs> and from start to finish. And the task force research is all funded through sponsorships. Through sponsorships. And we have about a minute left. And there's one question I want to ask: If you had to do one research project, that no, what would you want to research? Oh wow, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think looking at where we are now in the region, economic, workforce development, education are priorities. Um, because when we look at where we're going to be in 10 years, with more people retiring and business and industry growing, uh, a workforce shortage is going to be a significant issue. And obviously, when that happens, your economy is impacted. And you'll be there to probably do our research <laughs> for us. We hope so. so. So Terry and Susan, thank you so much for joining us today and letting us know what the institutes, how it impacts our community, and it's very interesting, and we wish you continued success. For Andy Mahalshik and everyone behind the scenes, I'm Jane Ann Bugda. We thank you for making Newsmakers part of your day. We have more information on this topic on pahomepage.com under the Newsmakers link, and we'll talk again next time.